this is Dave Pryor. Welcome to The Reluctant Agilist. Today I'm here with Alan Daly. Alan, say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and we are both alumni of Big Visible, um, which is a great place to work back in the day. And yes. Alan's moved on to some other stuff. And uh, we're going to talk about changes in the Agile field, what's happening with, with the layoffs and how that's affecting the whole community. But before we do that, Alan, would you mind sharing with these people like what you've been up to and what kind of work you do? Sure. So I, um, I've been an Agile coach. I don't know. I, I'd have to, I should have done the numbers before that question came up, but it's been more than a decade. Um, prior to that, I was a software engineer, mostly with embedded system kind of stuff, but also okay. other things. Um, so I, I come to the, Agile world with kind of this perspective of a person who, a a developer or an engineer that can benefit from that, and a leader of teams that can benefit from these agile ideas. Okay. And so uh, lately, I've been it's been I don't know eight years or something. I've been in large enterprises. Okay. Uh, doing a lot of safe stuff or and and oh. other kinds of things. Uh, that opens up a whole companies. new topic area for us. Okay, uh, go ahead. A whole other topic, right? <laughs> Safe is terrible. I've got it in my notes here in case. No, I'm that's not anyway. that's not what I was going to go with. But but anyway. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so um, I've en I enjoy the work in the larger organizations. I also enjoy work in smaller, say a few hundred organizations, um, a few hundred people. Okay. Uh, and so it's all exciting to me. The human side of technology is where I find joy. So. Okay. So that I was going to ask you, you said as somebody who benefits from agile and for somebody who's been doing this for so long where you're doing coaching work and things like that, I was going to ask like, other than a paycheck, what benefit do you still get from it? Um, oh, well, yeah, I get joy from it. Right. So there's a whole nother topic we could talk about, but, but one of the, one of my tenants, one of my foundational, my personal principles is yeah. that everyone, every person already has the power they need to contribute positively to wow, okay. their work or their life. Okay. And I love creating, sometimes it's just a little movement, sometimes it's a lot, but I love creating openings and places where people can see their own power and apply it and enjoy that, awesome. that, that moment of I have power and I can create good things. That's great. Well, okay, so I want to ask you a sort of a, a pre-question before we get to our main topic then. Okay. Um, when I talk with people about coaching, which I don't, I mean, I do a little bit of it now, but not like I did back in the day. Sure. Um, I always tell people that it's an incredibly rewarding job because you get to go different places and see people do things badly so many different ways and maybe help them. But that the hardest part about it is if you meet with nine clients, you'll tell all, you can help all of them see or show them better ways to work, but nine out of 10 are just going to say, you don't understand. They're making me do it this way. And I think, at least for me, you have to be able to realize that the impact you have isn't always while you're there. Yes. Right? Sometimes, I mean, in some cases, it could be years down the road before what you just described actually clicks for them, right? Yes. How do you so sustain yourself that then with that? Well, so one thing I've learned um, in coaching work is that it's it, people bring you in because they need you. Yeah. Sometimes they think they need you for one thing and really they need you for something else. And that's another discussion. But, yeah. but they bring you in because they need you. And if they didn't need you, then the work would be easy. Uh, so the work is hard. So I've, I've learned to uh, enjoy and focus and look for the small things. Okay. Because so often you don't get the big, huge change or yeah. you don't get the big aha where the whole organization shifts and people pat you on the back and all Skittles that stuff. Skittles fall from the sky, yeah. Yeah, but but I can help one person. I can help one team. I can help five teams in a you know 10,000-person company. Yeah. I can make their life a little better. Um, and that, I think that's really that's important because it's not just their job. It's their life that gets better. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. And also, I, I think you might say something to somebody and it might not click for three years and you'll be gone. But the impact of that could radiate out to hundreds of other people that they work with. 
Yes. So, you know, I have, I can tell stories of different people where I went in an organization, it was difficult. I felt like I failed. I didn't get anywhere. And then a year and a half later, somebody pings me on LinkedIn and says, Hey, I left that company. I'm at this company now. Things are great. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so those, those things don't happen as often as I want them to, at least I don't hear about it as often as I want to, but I know that those kinds of adventures or, you know, the, the saying is change your company or change your company. Uh, nice. Yeah. So, so sometimes the company that I'm at doesn't change, but the people that are there see something better and they go find yeah. it. You give them, so you give them hope. Yeah. That's cool. And you have to be very patient. I think when you're doing this job, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Even if, even if they bring you in because they know they have a problem that they want to be fixed, they may not really want to fix it. Sometimes I think they, I feel like they just, they want somebody there who can be responsible for fixing it without them having to do anything. Yeah. And that kind of segues into kind of where I want to go with our topic. All I'm right. Gonna... <laughs> Let's go. What's our yeah. topic? So, so there's a lot of, you know, it started, I think, with Capital One was the big splash, like, I don't know, maybe that's been a year ago now or yeah, a little over was, a year. Uh, where they said, hey, we don't have agile people anymore. And somehow that gave permission for lots of other companies to look at what is the value we're getting from these agile coaches? Yeah. Um, I, I uh, was uh, in a wave of those kinds of layoffs. I got laid off from a large bank. Um, back in the spring. Okay. Uh, and, and it was kind of along those lines, like the title of, they sent out a spreadsheet that says, here's the people being laid off and how old they are. Right. They have to prove that it's not age discrimination. Oh, that's awful. But, but, but the, but the, the spreadsheet says, says non-value people, non-value producers. It actually said that. Yeah. Um, wow. So there was a, you know, like a half dozen coaches laid off a bunch of project managers, uh, people along those lines that were kind of like the planning. It's a pretty and, you know, harsh way to let somebody go. Yeah. Well, I think they handle it fairly well, except that spreadsheet was pretty raw. Um, okay. So, so I was part of that wave and, and I think the agile community is uh, doing a lot of infighting mm -hmm. and a lot of analyzing of what did we do wrong? Yeah, and analyzing what we did, we do wrong is it's helpful, it's fine, but I'm not seeing a lot of conversations about the whole environment in which this is taking place. Yeah, um, it seems like uh, we we want to better ourselves, but we're not talking about what happened to us to the yeah. other community, or or systemically what is creating that. I want to I want to stick on the value thing for a second. Yeah, sure. And just see what your take is on this. So, when I was a PM, and I would teach other PMs or mentor other PMs, one of the things I was always trying to get across, and I and I feel the same way about a Scrum Master job. If you're really really good at your job, people are probably looking at you going, "What the hell does that guy do all day?" Like, yes, it's the people that are always putting out fires. They're usually starting a lot of fires too. But they're really like, look at me, look at all the value I produce. Um, I, I think that tends to be kind of a smokescreen a lot of the times. But I think some of us are probably, myself, I would say, is fall into this. I'm not great about declaring the value that I produce. Like, is there is there something coming out of that situation you were in where you've reflected on it and felt like, there, there, there's a way that you could have made your value more overt or more obvious to them. And would that, because that doesn't seem to me like your nature, but right. I, I don't know. It's, well, you, you know me well enough that that is not my yeah. nature. Um, I, I sometimes struggle, for example, writing a resume or, or, or a bio, <laughs> you know, write your biography. Yeah. What the hell do I do? Yeah. Don't brag about me. I don't want to brag about me. Um, you're, 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 you're touching on this kind of, uh, difficulty we have in still in business where we want people to be team members and contribute yeah. to the organization as a whole. Cause, cause I cannot by myself, if I was a developer, for example, I cannot by myself produce value to the application. I need right. operations people. I need product people. I need testers, all that user researchers, testers, you know, a lot yeah. of people. So, 
So, so as a developer, how do I say, well, I am the one who created this value? But on the other hand, most companies, reward systems, performance evaluation, et cetera, is based on the individual, right? Yeah. And, and so we have this, it's a conflicting thing to, to do this. So um, I, th I think what, what, we're, what happened to me, mm -hmm. to, to focus back at me, I was at the company, the bank, for six months and four other. And you were four, coaching, right? I was coaching, I, I, enterprise agile coach, VP enterprise agile coach was so my title. I would imagine most of that six months you were just observing. I was just learning. starting to get into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was placed in a division that hadn't had coaching for more than a year. Uh, they were obviously a division. They were a division from small companies that had been acquired and kind of mashed okay. together. And so they're still figuring out what do we, how does this become one thing? Because there are pockets of different, anyway, there's a lot going on. Yeah. And so I was just beginning to, to, to actually start trying to make changes. I just beginning to get on leadership calendars, et cetera. And then this layoff happened, right? So myself wow. and five agile coaches and some other people, there were five of us all hired within a week of each other. All five of us were let go. Like wow. we were the newest coaches, right? So yeah. we were the first to let go. So, so in that case, yes, okay, I could probably have been better at, at explaining what I was doing, why I was doing it, what value I have, et cetera. But I also sincerely believe that I was just simply a number in a spreadsheet and yeah. among the newest people, therefore the newest people go first. Yeah. Um, so I try to work on that. The, the difficulty that happens is that the people were, the people who bring us in, like I alluded at the very beginning, the people who bring us in want us to fix something. But when mm -hmm. we get there, often the something is just, is a symptom of something else that needs right. to be fixed. Um, and it's often fix the teams, makes the teams faster. They are not yeah. meeting their deadlines or their estimates or whatever, right? And and the reasons why those things are happening are are things that Beyond the manager the structure. Yeah. It's outside the team. Ooh, you just gave me a perfect segue into the safe thing, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, I'm a strong believer in Lewin's equation. Okay. I don't, I don't know if you've heard we'll of that. I have to explain that to everyone. Yeah, now, now that I've mentioned it. Uh, this is it back here. Can only see ha only half of it's going to come in because it's oh, okay. Cut. There you go. Okay. All right. Behavior. So I'm kind of off. I'm here, still here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Behavior is equal, is a function of the person and the environment. Okay. All right. Okay. Most companies, you like can put it back company, I've been in companies that, that, they focus so much on the person, like three, four, five levels up in, in management, mm -hmm. they're asking, how come your people aren't performing? And yeah. very few managers are asking, why is the environment such that the people are not performing? And this, this extends way beyond work. I mean, this is in school systems as well. Yeah, this comes from social science, right? Social psychology. Yeah. Um, but But it applies in work in that, most organizations are so focused on output. They're so focused on individual performance yeah. that they don't look around the environment and curate the environment such that the performance they desire happens or would just naturally happen. Yeah. So, so in the agile, in this current moment, right? We're in this right. moment of people talking about agile is dying or is, or isn't relevant or somehow needs to be different. Um, we need to be able to show our value. Um, to me, that's kind of focusing on the person and not the environment. And we need we need to focus that. We can't ignore one or the other. Right. But but the interesting thing is that the market, people hired agile coaches to fix teams. Yes. And we shouldn't be surprised that there were coaches willing to go fix teams. Right. Instead of fix the thing that causes the system. The yeah. Um, and so I think we've been we as the agilists, somehow the message that we missed for management and for leaders is that the environment needs to shift. It's not just the teams doing agile, it's the environment needs to shift such that agile can work well. Yeah. Okay. So I want to 
talk about that part in a second, but I want to okay. say something first. Somebody said to me on another podcast, um, cause I want, so we're going to come back to the systems thing in a second. Okay. But, uh, I was in, interviewing another guy who'd written an article about, he was kind of chastising all the agile purists who kind of, you know, go around bashing people for not knowing like just Kanban agile or is it from lean, things like that. Um, and in the conversation, we were talking about the layoffs and he said, you know, before they wanted agile and maybe the companies think they already have it. And I'd be like, yeah, but they're doing it wrong. And he said, yeah, but it's still doing better than waterfall. So even if it's like it's this half broke, like not what we would consider agile, it's just like sloppy, it's a mess, but it but it it limps along a little better than waterfall limped along. So from their perspective, the problem's been addressed and maybe they think they need to go address other problems now because they weren't really signed on for the magical promised land of agile in the first place. Agile was a means to an end for them and they made a little bit of ground. So, eh. Whatever for the coaches. I want to see how you respond to that. Yes. So, like, you know, you have to you have to find joy in the small movements. I said earlier. Sure. I, yeah. I, I can see that totally. That an organization might say, "Well, the teams are you know five percent happier according to our surveys, or and suck, so, suck a little bit less." Yeah. So we're good, right? And. Um, all kinds of models pop in my head, like the agile fluency model, right? The agile fluency mm -hmm. model says you don't have to be utopian agile. You can take right. a step and that might be good enough for you. And that could be. Um, I th I think where I take issue or, or worry or my concern is that the people that are deciding it's good enough are often people who don't understand how good it could be. Yes, I think that's very true. Yeah. There's, there's the idea of meeting, meet them where they are, mm -hmm. but also meet them where they could be. Yeah. Or show them where they could be. Yeah. Um, and uh, sometimes those people that are making those choices aren't interested in digging into where they could be. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of takes us right back around to the systems thing. So the first thing I want to ask about that is, I'm trying to figure out if my understanding of systems thinking is just fairly naive, but it seems to me like six or seven years ago, that wasn't part of the conversation. People weren't talking about the system. They were talking about the teams or the team, mm -hmm. the company's ability to deliver. It was just about the delivery mechanism, not about this holistic, how does the way we finance things impact people's ability to deliver or handle HR or create an environment because you're basically saying like a coach comes in, teach this plant to thrive in rocky soil with no sunlight. Right. And that's kind of a tall order. Yes, it is a tall order. It's um, having agile address the delivery part, right? Right. The whole, the whole value stream, I'll use value stream, but let's call the value stream mm -hmm. the system. Yeah. Right. The delivery part. Here's some. Here's some. Some feature requests come in, and I'll, okay, those capabilities are now there, right? Uh, that's the easy sale for agile, or it has yeah. been. Um, again, it's kind of this: fix the teams or go after that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, yes, I would say six or seven years ago, like six or seven years ago. Uh, you know, I was still involved with Solutions IQ or Big Visible before that in an environment where I was part of, I can think of at least two engagements where we fired the client, right? I, I had the benefit of working for- Good old days. <laughs> I had the benefit of working for a consulting company that, that two months in would look around and go, yeah, you all, you leaders are not changing and giving us the access we need. We're walking away. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think we're in the situation we're in because, and who can blame them? Somebody wanted to get the money by not walking away. Yep. Uh, and, and it might be, I, I can't remember who said it and I can't even remember where, cause in, in my world right now of job searching, I'm on all kinds of social media sites and stuff, sure. but, um, somebody said that, that what we're seeing now is the great filtering. In okay. Agile. 
that the agile people who who cannot strategically show value or how their work is valuable mm -hmm. and are not able to influence manage, management and leadership to actually adjust things that make agile work well yeah those are the ones that will fall by the wayside um, okay and there might be some truth to that uh that, yeah. that you no longer can be a coach that just comes in and and spouts platitudes or right spouts there has to be some outcome you you need to have Visible some outcome, outcome. You need to be able yeah. show some outcome okay um, and i agree with that to some extent so with the firing of the clients there's something that's because i that's come up in conversations i've had with people recently and and i remember back in the day when that would happen and i would it was like a thing of pride because we'd be like yeah you're not you're not ready when you're ready give us a call but you're not mature enough for us to help you yet you can't hear what we're saying and there was a certain arrogance to that and now mm -hmm. i think about i don't remember where i heard it but somebody was talking about it had to do with like something to do with preaching but basically if you only went after the people that wanted to be converted you're not really doing your job. You have to go to the places where people don't necessarily want you, aren't ready to hear you, and and help them see and find a, a path if if and when they're ready to do it. But in that context, if they want you there because it makes them feel better or feel like they're checking a the box and they're becoming more agile, if they're not willing to put forth the effort, could you... I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I would say that that you like if that was you and you were the coach that that the coach failed in that context. If the client's not ready to to adjust, that's so. So this is yes. Um, you're touching on the the idea that I've struggled with for a long time is how do you how do you define success and failure for the agile coach? Yeah, or for the scrum master. Right, you can take it to a scrum master, if and, the, and the client maybe too. Because how do you minister to somebody who doesn't want that or isn't hearing it? You know, correct. Um, it's possible for an agile coach to successfully do their thing, and the client see it as a failure. Yeah, because you're misaligned on what the, okay. you think the coach is going to do and what you think you need. Yeah. Um, one of the skills that a coach needs to have, any change agent, whether it's agile coaching or not, but a change agent needs to be able to articulate why the change is necessary and what the benefits of the change are such that leaders and managers and other people can get on board with that or become aligned with that. You have to kind of seduce them into the promise. Okay. And and so the the difficulty that I've seen in my coaching career is that that often the that conversation where mm -hmm. you sit down with the person who asked to, to have you, right? I'm the coach and this person says, I want you. You have to be willing to sit down and create goals and benefits that you're trying to create to do that together. You have to do that together. Yeah. So that so that you understand so that they understand their participation is necessary for my success. Okay. It's our success, not yeah, yeah. It's a shared thing, right? And 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 that conversation often doesn't happen, or it happens during the sales process, but then the coach arrives and doesn't wasn't part of that conversation, doesn't know what it is the expectations are of the yeah. VP that brought them in or whatever. Um, you you got to keep having those conversations, just like the team needs to keep talking to the user and the customer to make sure that they're aligned with what they're supposed to be building. The agile right. coach, the agile change agent needs to be talking to the people who's paying for them to be there mm -hmm. to keep talking about what is our goal? Are we reaching our goal? Are we getting there? What are the metrics toward the goal? If any, how do we know we're getting there or how yeah. do we know we've arrived? So, uh, okay, you can finish. No, well, I was just, I was just going to say that conversation I've had repeatedly difficulty having that conversation yeah. with, with people that need to have it because they often, sometimes they will say, I don't have the time for that. I have other yeah. priorities or I already know what, what you're supposed to be doing. Just go do it. 
but yet we haven't <laughs> had that alignment conversation. We haven't verbalized it. We haven't written it down. Yeah. Uh, we think we know, but we don't. So when I was, when I was a project manager and I first learned about that um, chaos study statistic about, you know, 70% of the projects failing one respect mm -hmm. or another. Um, I was thinking about the fact that like, this is my job. It's not professional baseball. So batting 300 isn't going to make me a million dollars. If I go to work every day thinking 70% of what I try to do is going to turn into failure, th that's going to suck. And I didn't want to live that way. So I started to find other ways to measure my performance. And I would say as a project manager, that some of my, the projects I am most proud of, the ones where I was just freaking great at my job ended in complete and total failure. Um, but if you were my client and you were like, I want to drive my car into a brick wall, I would say, okay, well, this is what's going to happen. This is why that's a bad idea. And if you were like, I want to do it anyway, I'd be like, let's go and I'll get an ambulance. And when we were putting you in the ambulance, I'd be like, okay, do you remember that, you know, we talked about this and it was really easy for me in a kind of, again, arrogant way as a project manager, but I'll say, I told you so but I don't think that that plays in an agile context. I mean, you couldn't, could you go into a client and say, here's what's going to, here's what we're going to try to do. Here's how you're going to resist it. When you resist it, this is what's going to happen. Cause you can call, you all know that's going to happen, all yeah. that stuff. And if you tell them and then you point it out to them when it's happening, that's not going to make them not pissed off that they don't see the outcome they thought they were going to get when they brought you in. I mean, that's kind of the rub, right? You can't yeah. be responsible for another person. That's 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 kind of the rub, right? Yeah. Yes. The things that make a project manager or an agile coach fail look like a failure. Yeah. Call it that. Um, the the uh, what am I trying to say? The things that impinge on that or the input yeah. that failure. The inputs that can cause the failure that are outside of the coach's control far outnumber yeah. <laughs> the coach's abilities to address them. Where the magic comes in. Yeah. So <laughs> so this is the this is the quandary of being a change yeah. agent is that there are far more things that can show failure or cause failure than the things that you have control over. Yeah. And this is this is again, I'll go back to this is why you need to have a goal or benefits list, not a long one, three things. We yeah. want this to happen in six months. And the how to get there includes the people that have the power and authority, et cetera, to make things happen or to yeah. minimize the number of things that create failure. Um, and that's a hard conversation to have. How important is it in that conversation to include what they're willing to give up to achieve it? Yes, it needs to be in there. Okay. I mean, basic for for example, a basic thing is, mm -hmm. ha hello VP, you brought me in to change change your organization. How much space do you have on your calendar? Okay. Yeah. Because you're going to need to spend time on this change. And if you tell me you have no room, you're triple booked on every single hour of yeah. every day, you have to change that, and I'll help yep. you. But, but you can't just stay completely booked and 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 out of earshot of me and this change. Okay. You have to be part of it. Yeah. So can you then have? Let's just say that they go along with that. They create space. Can you then have a conversation with them that says, "How are we going to measure our success in this?" I mean, I, I guess like where we're, where we are now, I think the conversation I would want to have would be six months from now, you're going to be wondering like, what was the impact? And I want us to have a way of knowing if we had an impact beyond just fixing a symptom. Yes. Yeah. So, so that, that becomes the metrics discussion, right? Like, how do you know that the agile coach is doing well? And my and my first and and my first question back to them is, well, how do you know you're doing well now? <laughs> and and the, the question that that question often often does not have a good answer. Yeah. And so then you work with that leader to create an answer to that question. Can we do a baseline now with some sort of metrics that you trust, that you love, that are valuable right. to you? Let's set that now. And six months from now, we can check. Right. And. 
and some of those metrics might be like, well, uh, a bunch of people are going to quit. Uh, people are going to complain about change. They're going to be frustrated. They're going to be irritated. And so will you. And then we'll know we're making progress. <laughs> right? Well, yes, it could be. <laughs> Right. Could if be. everyone hates me, we're we're headed in the right direction. Right, you can do that. You know, if you there's debate about this, but you can do the sadder change curve, right? And you can tell yeah. them, hey, six months from now we're going to be on this trough right here. And, yeah. And there's debate about whether to use that or not. But anyway, that's you can give that it's kind of option. diagram. It's an option. You can, um, for metrics, you know, I'm a big fan of the GQM model, which is what is the goal. What questions do we need to answer to know we're reaching that goal? Okay. And what metrics will help us answer those questions? Okay. Um, and so always have those things, strategic goals or change goals. You should not be collecting metrics that have nothing to do with your goal or aren't, aren't clearly defined ahead of time. They, they're tied to that goal. And that, that's helpful. So and that would be and, and include asking how does this metric of velocity or whatever it is demonstrate we've made any progress? Correct. What what question does it answer? Yeah. Right. Do you um, do you think that I'll be quiet in a second? One sure. More question, then I'll shut up. <laughs> do you think that when you ask your clients if they're more traditional, that they know how to answer that question? Can they come up with an answer or are they just going to roll out and say, I want all the same metrics I've always looked at because that's what I look at? Um, they, it's a mixed bag. Okay. It, it's often a struggle to answer those questions. Um, if they want to keep their current metrics, then we need to look at them and see, okay, what questions are are being are answered by answering? these metrics? Are they a good answer to that? Like velocity went up. Well, can velocity be used in that way? The way that that metric comes from, is it actually yeah. useful to call it a production, a productive, pro, a measure of productivity? Mm -hmm. Probably not um, because it can be gained so easily, et cetera, as soon as you yeah. start using it that way. Um, so so you, you need to have those discussions as a coach uh, to look at the metrics they currently have and say, okay, what are these metrics actually telling you? Yeah. Because you're going to make decisions from these metrics, so we need to know what they actually mean and where they came from and what, how do they help us. And that's going to go back to that systemic thing as well, right? Because you're going mm -hmm. to need to have metrics that show the health of the system or the systems. I always think of it like Agile is like a virus and, and any company's got antibodies that attack the virus. So when you bring it in, it might make the system healthier, but it's going to make the system feel sick first. And... You have to know how to interpret those metrics and what they yes. mean and how they show outcomes. Yeah, this is, and this is something to touch on. I think most change agents, Agile or not, are, we underestimate the momentum of the current way of working. Yeah. It's, it, it's the momentum of that way of thinking, the comfort that's there, because we're humans, right? It's the same right. for me. As an individual, we we perpetuate behaviors, even though those behavior we want to change those behaviors, and it happens in an organization all the time. Uh, that's why you get agile in name only. Yeah. That's why you get changes that you know explode and look so wonderful, and three months later they're like almost gone. Yeah, um, it's not because necessarily the antibodies you speak of. It's not because an antibody is not necessarily a person actively trying to shut it down. Right. It's just that they're going along with their habits. And in, and if the coach isn't there to remind them, hey, you said you weren't going to do that anymore, or we're yeah. going to do it in a different way, or here's how we can do it in a different way, you have to keep reminding the organization that there's a shift happening. Yeah. And, and, and they need to do it in a different way now. Um, the, the example I try to give many times is... Uh, have have the person i do this in sometimes in training classes but i also do it in even in one-on-one -on -one conversations with a manager and they they think i'm silly at first but i ask them to untie their shoe and then tie it in a different way than they oh, usually wow do. right if they use the bunny ears don't use the bunny ears do it some other way and 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 then i that's i say okay how that felt 
Yeah. If you're not feeling that at least once a week or even several times a week in the way you're the way you're working, if you're not feeling that kind of unsureness, uncertainty, yeah. will this really work? I have to work a different way now. If you're not feeling that, then we're not changing. So, okay. So the discomfort as it shows up or the anxiety or whatever you want to call it, for for us, that would be perceived as a measure of success or an indicator that we were headed in a positive direction. Correct. But for the person who had, they had back pain a certain way, they were really used to it, and you're forcing them to do yoga, and they're like, oh, it, it hurts when I stretch this muscle. And you're like, good. And they're like, yeah, back pain was easier. I mean, that, cause, but that's mm -hmm. what happens, right? They They want, you know, I don't, I don't feel like people want the change. I feel like people want the result of the change. It's yes. like when you don't go to the gym, if you go work out, it sucks. If you haven't worked out in a while, you're like, it's just awful. And you don't go because you want to feel awful. You'll go because you want to be in shape again. But you have yes. to hold that goal and be willing to sacrifice to get it. Yes. And that's, that's, I think that's the key of, we, we call it, hey, uh, you're not following the Agile Manifesto principles or, hey, you don't have the Agile mindset, right? We, we give this, this momentum of the, the current stuff, we give it different yeah. names and different, we call it, call it out in different ways. Right. But, but that's what it is. It's that change is hard. Change feels hard. Even if on the other side, you'll be so much better it's still hard to go through that change because now yeah. you have to pay attention to how you work instead of just paying attention to the work. Right. To put it, to put it mildly. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's part of why it's so easy for a coach. Mm -hmm. Coach still wants to get paid. Yeah. And so then a manager says, Hey, you know, this estimating the story points is just not working. Let's go back to hours or what, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Or, you you say to the manager, the leader, you got to stop telling your people to equate story points to ours. It just makes story points useless. Uh, let's not have a formula for that. Yeah. And they're like, well, we've always been estimating in hours. And so we can keep using the points. We just, people are uncomfortable with that, whatever. Right? The hard yeah. part, the hardest part for the coach is you can't change everything all at once. And so sometimes you have to right. say yes okay, fine, let's it's use story points equating mm -hmm. hours because there's this other issue that we need to change first anyway, and it's a yeah. bigger impact anyway. And and so then you start suffering from what I call creeping normality. You yeah. compromise the change so that you can work on some other aspect of the change, right. and then people start thinking that the compromise you made is normal. And, and yeah. that's another difficulty. That's a whole other thing. Okay. So, so what... I mean, I know you're looking for a gig right now, but when you have a gig and you're coaching again, are there different ways that you're going to want to present evidence of the impact that you're having? Yes. Okay. Um, as I talked about, that alignment discussion mm -hmm. needs to happen. Um, where I got laid off just recently, the department I was in was as it turned out, was going through a um, VC funding thing. Okay. I didn't know that until after some time that I was there. But but because of that, that was one of the reasons I could not get the time needed to align with the leaders of that division. Yeah. Right? Um, so in my next gig or my next work, mm -hmm. I have learned that it's more important to – more important. It's it's more important than I expected. Mm -hmm. I can't just spend months fixing the teams. Right. And not having that conversation of what change are we after here? What's the overall thing? And how does leadership and managers get involved yeah. with that change? How do they need to be involved? And are there things in the way? Like if I had been able to have that conversation where I was with that division leader, Right. And and hopefully and, and say, hey, is there are there things in the way of doing this? And even though he couldn't tell me at the time, hey, yeah, there's a VC thing going on, whatever, right. whatever. 
he could have said, well, there's this big initiative that I'm in charge of and it's taking all my time. Then my answer would have been going, going back to the agile office, you know, that I was part of and saying, Hey, this division is not in a place where they can make shifts. Um, well, or you could ask that person, well, for, you know, this initiative that you're working on, what metrics or what measurements can I track that will show you how this is positively impacting what you're doing? Yes. And that could, that could take a while just to, I mean, I had one guy, it took me six months to figure out what question to ask him um, about, because he couldn't an answer the metrics question. He had no no concept of what was available, no idea about, you know, what he should look at or why or how it was going to help him or how it would drive decision making. I mean, he was just like totally locked into the old way. So for me to show him a, a real life example, this is one of those projects that went horribly wrong. And it is when it when this happened, I was almost in tears because I was so excited about the success. It was a project that was doomed to failure from the moment I walked in the door. Like a, a statement of work had been signed, promises were made, and we were going to miss the deadline by somewhere between eight months and five years. Like at the beginning, we knew that. There was a lot of hostility between the, the, the business contact and the head of IT. And my whole job was to keep them apart because every time they got together, it was just a giant screaming match. Wow. And, and when we did the post, we did a postmortem on the project when we finished it. And we had all these developers that in the beginning were, were quitting like every week because of the, all the hostility. The ones that made it through the end of the project, when we asked them about the hostility between those two, two leaders, they had no awareness of it at all. Whereas I was like, that was every day of my life for eight months. And the fact that I was able to protect the team from that, I mean, regardless of what we delivered and didn't deliver, that was massively successful. I don't know if that, I don't think that mattered to the organization so much, except maybe in a retention way, but there's metrics that you have to be able to use for yourself. And then metrics, I think that you can use to report to, to help people understand progress, I guess, if that's the right way of thinking yeah. of it. Yes. Um, and, 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 what another thing that I've learned is that you don't shy away from making things visible. Yeah. Right. Yeah, even including if including the ugly. In, even if the manager or the leader or whatever doesn't want to talk about a certain problem or a systemic issue or whatever, then I need to make sure that I make it visible consistently. Yeah. The impact of that. Yeah. I um, I don't I remember a thing at BV that, and I don't remember where I heard it, but there was a thing about a coaching question of what did you do to try to get fired this week? And when I tell people the story, it's always like, because there was an expectation at, at, that you would be an irritant. Right. That that was part of the job, right? Part yeah. of the job was to point out things that needed to change. That's I, somewhere on the internet archive somewhere. There's a blog post I have about scrum masters. And, and one of the statements that I had in there was that, Hey, if you're hiring a scrum master and they do their job well, you are hiring someone to tell you what's wrong in mm -hmm. your organization. That's what agile coaches do. That's what other change agents do. But now and, with all the scrum masters getting fired, who's going to do that? Well, so, and, and not to try and derail our conversation here, I'm scrum masters are not getting fired. To me, for what I see, there's lots of scrum masters being hired. It's the agile coaches that are going away. Okay. And 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 you can go find delivery manager, product manager, product owner. Okay. Um, those kinds of positions are getting agile coaching stuff shoved into their descriptions. So maybe it. So maybe the perception is that we've got this good enough handle on this that we can let these scrum masters, people that went and took, and I'm shooting myself in the foot by saying this, but somebody who went and took a two day class and passed a test an 11 year old Girl Scout can pass. Um, we don't need coaches because we have them. We don't need Alan with his t 10 to 15 years of experience because this person took a two day class. They'll figure it out. Yes. And uh, com companies are, are asking it's like they want traditional roles and traditional positions like mm -hmm. delivery manager or product manager. They want them to do the agile stuff and they don't want to pay 
a separate role right. for the agile coaching stuff. But they don't give them the time to do that stuff. And those people well, then that's, don't necessarily have the experience to do that stuff. Right. That, that's why I think, I think, I th sometimes I think that they're keeping the agile stuff somewhere so they can say they're still doing it. But in reality, it's not going to happen because the Keto product, on the manager, the product yeah. manager work is always going to take precedence over resolving a conflict or leading a retrospective. Right? Or it's, technical debt. Yeah. Because it's a or, ugly or and boring. changing the portfolio management structure or whatever. Right. It's, yeah. And so I think maybe I'm hopeful that companies will down the road a year from now, will look around and go, yeah, we really do need an agile coach because of I, these things that we think we want are not happening. So I, I agree with everything you said. I guess the one sh other shift that I see is um, I do know places that are laying off scrum masters and what they're replacing that job function with is a technical program manager, which seems to be a seasoned PMO leader who's also done a lot of agile transformation and has years of software development and also is an expert in design thinking which doesn't exist any, I mean, maybe there's like three people on the planet that have all that, but um, in addition to jettisoning coaches, I think there's a shift where there's now an ex or they're hiring people into roles, asking for a skill set that probably no one possesses and expecting them to do jobs that they're not trained or experienced to do. And there's going to be an impact. Yeah. Yeah, there will be an impact. It's kind of like they're saying, take this agile stuff and tie it to something that we can traditionally measure. Yeah. 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 If, if this agile stuff is done by a technical product manager, we know how to measure our technical product, the performance of a technical product manager. Right. We'll just have them do agile stuff too. So how is the coaching community or the agile community? Because this was something we talked about before we started recording. What are they doing to help or hurt this? Um, well, what I'm what I'm seeing, right, and it's always an incomplete picture because I'm just me, um, I'm just one person. Right. But what I'm seeing is the agile community is talking amongst themselves about it. how did this happen, and they're talking amongst themselves of what do we do about it mm -hmm. from the perspective of what an Changing agile coach us. can do. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could see or find the conversation that say, hey, we're having a conversation of why this is failing and we're, and we're including the leaders and the managers in this conversation. Um, because that's what we missed or somehow we missed. It's easy for, we took the easy path, we, the Agile community, we took the easy path of fix the teams or do the things that the manager asked us to, even mm -hmm. though the manager doesn't have the, foundational knowledge to be able to choose what really should be happening. Yeah. Cause those managers, most of them aren't getting up in the morning and being like, I can't wait to go screw those people up today. No, they're not. They're it's, they're doing what they feel is logical and reasonable. Yeah. And, and, and that's fine. It's just somehow the agile coaches were not part of that conversation and we didn't make that connection. And I think it's a mistake for us to talk just in the agile community about that fault when yeah. the people we didn't connect with aren't part of that conversation they need to be part of it but i don't i don't have the magic bullet of how to make that happen i'm i'm kind of in, of two minds with this because on the one hand you know you said that there was that report that said these people are not they don't add value um there's a part of me that feels like the question the company should have been asking was how did we add value for these people who we asked to help us change or how do we create a system that would allow them to, to show value. On the other hand, I'm kind of like, yeah, but the people that are upset about this are the ones that don't have their, you know, they get, they get laid off or they work in a place that's just toxic or whatever. And it's almost like sour grapes. And I guess you could look at it from both sides. I feel like there's going to have to be like an indictment of the behavior of companies because they're, they're, taking a short-term salve to a problem they're not really addressing, which is, a, like you said before, a systematic issue. Yeah, it's, I, it's, it's, it's the key. It's the thing, right? Yeah. So a couple of 
jobs back, just to again tell a short story, uh, I was tasked with after working with teams and setting up an agile release train and all that kind of stuff and and trying to create a value stream, I my task was to set up a portfolio management system. Okay. And I ran into uh, mostly passive aggressive PMO uh, people, uh, VPs, okay. leaders, C suite, yeah. who didn't want to change the way things were prioritized. Sure. And the way they were prioritized was chaotic and who Yeah, spoke but they knew that system. Whatever. They, they didn't want to go to a transparent system that said, hey, yeah. we have this portfolio sync every week and right. this is where Why we would you want that? Well. It, it, it became this wall, right? And and that's what we're talking about here, that same wall, right? How can Agile work somewhere? Well, we've got to get through that wall or break down that wall somehow so that the managers and leaders of the company right. can support these new ways of working or at least but that transparency is a direct threat to them many times and that trans not having their transparency is part of how they got the big office correct it's, it's and this is the same conversation why would know, i want a system that's going to take my office away you and i are you and i and you and other coaches that we worked with have had this same conversation over and yeah. over and over again and and i think that's in a nutshell, that's where we are. Yeah. Agile has hit that wall, that ceiling, whatever you want to call it. Right. And and the reaction is we don't need coaches anymore. So if you could snap your fingers and have the sea level of every company on the earth suddenly understand something, what would it be? That's um, my turn to stump you. The other day, Alan asked me what, to tell him what his superpower was, and I was like, "Damn, and <laughs> how do I do that?" <laughs> um, um, so I would go back to what I said very at the beginning when I was introducing myself. Um, people already have the power. Okay. Organizations need to get out of the way, and provide a channel or a, a guidance Ooh. for that power. Okay, and and. In my experience, so far in my life, the Agile principles are the best way or the, the currently the, the, the way that works or the way mm -hmm. that addresses that. There can be other ways to address it, and that's fine. You, know, you don't have to be an Agile organization. I've worked in, as a developer, I've worked in organizations that let me be a powerful person and make change and make impact. And I've also worked in places that didn't allow that. Yeah. And and so it's not, I believe in Agile because I think it's the shortest path to get there. But what leaders need to understand is that power people have the power to do what you want them to do and to create the great things. Get out of the way. Create a system so that they can use that power mm -hmm. in alignment and coordination of the strategic needs of the company. So I'd like to yes end that. Yes, and I would like everybody at the other end of the food chain who is walking through life thinking they're making me do this, the system is my problem, like I'm the victim of everything around me, to realize that the only one who's keeping you a victim is yourself. You have to acknowledge that you choose to do a job, you choose to show up, you choose to work with certain constraints, you can try to change them, but you're the one that comes in every day. And you have to own that and do what you can to take agency within your own space and that, feed your family at the same time, but it's a choice. Yeah. So if we wanted to do another episode on my leader follower spectrum, that addresses oh, what you're talking about here. That would be good. All right. We have another one to do then. Cool. All right. In other words, so leaders, if, to some extent, leaders yeah. will lead in the way that their followers make them lead. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, we'll have if, to schedule I, if I come into work and one. wait to be told what to do every day, my leader can't be a catalytic leader. All right. Now we are, you, you're now signed up for two other podcasts. Okay. <laughs> so what have we not addressed in this conversation that, that you were thinking of when we started? Because for me, it was just a really fun conversation. Um, and I hope it resonates with people. I hope it resonates I, with I hope, leadership. I hope it does too. I, I just, 
what I just the the part I wanted to address is we the agile community we've got to be reaching outside of us yeah. this current this current melees or whatever you want to call it cannot be resolved without participation with the people we serve do you, do you think that in order to do that we have to acknowledge that agile is not an end state that it is a mechanism of of achieving something else it's yes and we, okay. we have to and it always has been right agile yeah, is not but the, i think being we got, agile is not the goal using we all agile, got paid to make people be agile right uh <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now we're mixing metaphors like the do agile, be agile, whatever. Doing yeah, agile yeah. is not the goal. Yeah. Using agile principles and ways of working to have achieve a better state. work environment and achieve business goals is the goal. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. If people want to track you down with follow up questions to talk more about this, what's the best way to do it? Um. Uh. You can find me on X, although I don't use it actively. But if somebody pings me on formerly known as Twitter, Twitter yeah. at at I'm at Daily Agile, no spaces. Okay, Daily Agile. I'll include that. All um, right. And I and I've moved on to Mastodon. Okay. Uh, so they can find me in Mastodon, and then of course on LinkedIn. Cool. Although when you go to LinkedIn, there's a, another guy, Alan Daly. No, I'll put link. I'll put mind. a link to it. I'll put a link to it. Okay. Good so deal. they can get to it from the show notes. Um, I really appreciate you doing this. And I want to tease the other two podcasts right now. Sure. And you only, so one of them is going to be your leader follower thing. Right. The other one, since I am not deeply versed in safe, you have experience with it. I have been working with a couple companies who are kind of leaning it safe. Mm -hmm. And, ha and, and we're not going to go into it now. I just want to tease it, but at a uh, product management tech lead level there are quarterly commits that are made and given to the teams who are so busy trying to finish the last quarterly commit they can't look at it but they agree to do it because they feel like they have to and when i ask about it they say they have to do all this stuff and they're supposed to plan it into sprints so they just divide up the work by the number of sprints in the quarter and they they plan that and they over plan every sprint they fail every single sprint they have carryover work in every single sprint and i say why are you committing to this and they say because we have to and i say have you ever done this and they say no we can't do it but we have to do it and that is something that i don't understand <laughs> at all any logic behind it i'm sure it's bastardizing what dean's intention was right. um, with pi planning but i would love if we could have a conversation about that um, yeah, what it's that supposed would be to be, all the impacts of it. Because I understand from a business level why you'd want to push it and what creates it. And that goes back to the systems thing, too. But um, if you're open to that, I'd love to talk about that in the future as well. Yes. Yeah. And I'd love to talk about that. I'm not, I'm not a safe fanboy, but I'm also not against it. It can be very valuable and create great things. So cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, man. It was great catching up sure. with you. This is fun. It was fun. If you learn to work the old way, but the new way is what you need. My job's to make that switch from old to new. So